What does Themistocles have in common with General David Petraeus? Military historian Victor Davis Hanson, author of the new book, The Savior Generals, is about to explain. Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, now appearing on the website of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Peter Robinson. A classicist and military historian, Victor Davis Hanson is a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He is the author of countless essays and columns and of books that include The Western Way of War, Infantry Battle in Classical Greece, A War Like No Other, How the Athenians and Spartans Fought the Peloponnesian War, and Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles in the Rise to Western Power. Dr. Hansen's newest book, The Savior Generals, How Five Commanders Saved Wars That Were Lost from Ancient Greece to Iraq. Victor Davis Hansen, welcome. Thank you for having me, Peter. My pleasure. The Savior Generals, Victor, quote, 11th hour landscapes of battle when most at home and officers in the field have given up on a war as in irrevocably stalemated or lost, draw in a different sort of commander, close quote. What kind of men are savior generals? Well, they're eccentrics, they're iconoclasts, they're the people that don't start wars and sometimes they don't even finish them. But at the 11th hour, as you quoted, we need a particular type of person uh, who can do what other people cannot. So they have a personality profile, they have a resume that's different, they're outspoken, they're not team players necessarily, they're looked on with envy and jealousy at many times. They come in, they have nothing to lose. They're sort of like Shane or the Magnificent Seven, if I could use a Western image, or Ethan Edwards and the Searchers. They're tragic heroes and they come in and they do things, they've studied the situation, they're optimistic, they encourage they see they, uh, they, they, they see they see things that other people don't see they in see. some at least strictly military sense they're visionaries they can see they're visionaries and they're very distrustful they're empirical in the sense that they don't just follow a uh, 51 percent opinion so if everybody say the iraq war is lost or everybody said we can't win in korea or everybody said athens is burned we better give up they don't necessarily you know, disagree with that, but they want to know why, and they want to know how, and they will, and they look at the situation, and then they convince people to let them have a chance, and people give them a chance that they otherwise would not have if things had been better. So, how did you become? Well, no, I was about to ask how you became interested in writing about this special subset of generals, but let me let me get to that. But start with a prior question, which is, how did Victor Hansen, growing up on a raisin ranch in Selma, California? deep in the agricultural heart of the Central Valley, fifth generation of ranchers in that place. How did a California ranch boy become so interested in classical and military history that he is today one of the leading classicist and the author of a couple of dozen books of military history. How did that people, happen? People react against their surroundings. So if you were told, go to the library every day, you might not want to go to the library. But I was told, go out and irrigate, get on the tractor, and I was out in the middle of nowhere. And that was part of it. I was trying to do the opposite of what I had to do. But I had really gifted parents. I had a mother who had gone to Stanford, who was a judge, and a father who was at uh, World War II. I think he was a hero. He flew 40 missions in a B-29. And uh, they the encouraged me. So even though we Did were Did your dad talk to you about the war? All the time, after uh, my mother died especially. but. I was out in the middle of nowhere and my, I would read books and they would encourage that even though we had to work on the farm. My parents would, and they'd also say, if you want to save the farm, don't farm. Everybody who farms loses it, so you need an outside income. So uh, Victor, I want you to study, study, study and do something and then come back and live here, but don't try to farm and rely on that income. So it was practical and theoretical and idealistic. And by the way, you, you're a couple of dozen books, you're teaching positions, you have saved the farm. Uh, I have, still have the 45 acres in the original house, yes. All right, so now to this question. After all the other books you've written, how did you become interested in this subset of well, cranky geniuses? Yeah, well, I, I had been part of the genre, the great battles of antiquity and the modern era, carnage and cultures, and there's this whole genre of the 19th century, the great captains. Who are the, Wellington, Napoleon, who were the best, Patton, um, and then also, who were the worst? So anatomy of folly, anatomy of error, anatomy of defeat. But 
in the, every one of those cases, when books are published with compendia of good or bad people, there's so many extraneous factors. Yeah, you know, uh, General Patton was great, but the Third Army was great, and America had a lot, America had a lot more uh, advantages in 1944 than did the Germans. And Zhukov was great. However, the Germans were exhausted at that time. The Japan, we were great with Nimitz, but the Jap there were other things that you could. I guess, factor into the equation. So I was trying to think, well, how do we really find greatness when everything is bad? Nobody wants to win. Uh, the soldiers have no morale left. Technologies maybe not be, not be an advantage. And is there anybody who comes in when by all uh, other criteria, it's, defeat is looming and they should fail and they don't fail. And there's about 15 or 20 throughout history. So you look for examples when Everything is going against a particular side, mm -hmm. except one man. They well, have. They we, have that. we do. We Go do ahead. that in our own society. I mean, what made Steve Jobs famous? It's not that he founded Apple and he had a great career. It's because Apple floundered after he left, and it was completely destroyed, essentially. And they brought him back in. He saved it, and that's what we look so for. It is empirically demonstrable that what made Apple great is Steve Jobs. Is Steve Jobs, and nobody would have taken if you had said. Steve Jobs is going to go back to Apple next year and the stock is worthless. Nobody would have thought he could ever turn it around. And so we look in business and corporations and universities for these turnaround artists. That's the word we use. Right. Savior, right. savior businessmen. Right. And then savior also is a moral term. It doesn't mean not only you save, but it, it, you can't say rescue generals. Savior has sort of a moral ethical tint that the war should be saved. Which, by the way, you embrace because all five of the figures here, you approve of I these do. men. I think the Byzantine... Empire was better than the alternative. I think what we did in South Korea was superior to North Korea. Uh, I think the Union should have won the war. Let's start. We, uh, alas, we won't take all five because this is television. A book is one thing; television is another. But let's uh, let's try to get a flavor for, uh, for this book. Themistocles, 480 BC. Xerxes, Emperor of Persia, constructs a pontoon bridge, crosses the Hellespont into Greece with a force of perhaps a quarter of a million. Quarter million. He conquers Thrace, Macedonia, Thessaly, and as he approaches Attica, the Greeks attempt to stop his land forces at Thermopylae. Yes. And they fail. They fail. And they try to stop his naval forces at Artesium. It fail. And again they fail. And Athens is evacuated. And burned. And burned. And now all, the Athenian population goes to the island of Salamis. So, Salamis and places in the Peloponnese at Troizen, Egana, another island. And they have a fleet of triremes. Yes. And a, and a commander, not a general, it wasn't called a general, but a man called Themistocles. First of all, tell us who is Themistocles? Well, he's sort of an eccentric guy who's been around for 20 years. He's of suspect lineage. He's maybe a quarter or a half Thracian. He's a radical of the radical party that believes in more democracy, not less. He'd not an aristocrat, has no not time for Not an aristocrat. Them. And more importantly, he's a visionary. He's saying, you know what, we won a marathon 10 years ago, but infantry battle is just not going to do it this time. And if you're going to have a democracy, you just can't entrust the defense of the city-state into land-owning population. It's only 50%. So he was a visionary that wanted more ships. He wanted the poor people to be paid by the state to row. And he believed that uh, sea power offered advantages for a maritime cosmopolitan city in a way that infantry didn't. But his problem was that there's no Greece left north of the Peloponnese, and the people south, and there are powerful states like Argos or Corinth, but especially Sparta said, why, why risk everything at Salamis when we can go across the isthmus of uh, Corinth and build a wall and just be a, a bunker mentality? So he, first he had to convince the Greeks that that was a short-term policy, they would be surrounded. And second, he had to come up with a strategy to beat a fleet that was three times larger than his own. And third, he had to fight in a coalition where he was suspect as being Athenian in general and Thracian or so, radical in particular. Xerxes occupies and burns Athens. Yes. It's a short march to the Strait of Salamis. Yes. Themis Themistocles now has perhaps 180 triremes. Yes. The Athenian contingent. The Athenian contingent has perhaps 180 triremes. And the Persians have... Somewhere between, the estimates in antiquity range from 650 all the way to 1,250, and the aggregate Greek is maybe 350, 370. So they're outnumbered two or three or even four, four times to yes. one. And a trireme is what? 
It's, it's almost a, closer to a war canoe than to a sailing ship in a way, isn't it? Someone in antiquity called it a floating spear. You have 180 rowers and, they, and they're in three different tri, three banks of rowing and they have a ram and they achieve speeds of up to about 10 knots for you know four or five minutes and they're sleek and they ram into other ships, make a hole and sink them. They can have archers, they can have marines, but their main uh, offensive weapon is the, is the ram and they're very unstable. So this is not, this is not, this is not naval warfare of maneuver. No, it's well, not... it is in a sense, but they're in a, a very compact, narrow bay of Salamis. Right. And the idea is that so once... go ahead, go ahead and take take us through the battle. Well, take us through the, the, battle. the whole idea is that they're in the narrows, and so Xerxes cannot take advantage of his numerical superiority. They just don't fit enough. And there's some controversies whether, by a stratagem, he he. Uh, convince the Persians to send some of the ships around the opposite side of the island. We don't know if that's true or not, but the point I'm getting at is that the Athenians and the Spartans and the Greeks in general knew the uh, current, the wind conditions, the, the, the activities, so to speak, of the, of the bay, and they were fighting on their own home territory, and they had a brilliant commander who was right with them in the first trireme, and the Persians were, to be frank, were coerced peoples. There were Greeks, there were Egyptians, there were Phoenicians, there was everybody in this polyglot, multicultural empire, and, and the, the king, king is up on the mountain. I was going to say, is that is that? Do we believe that to be true? Or is oh, we that, know it is true. Oh, so, so the king actually set up a throne on the yes, mountain to yes. watch the battle take watch place. Watch the battle take place be, before him. Yes, and and when a Greek was thrown into the water, he usually could swim, and he could swim to an island where there were Greeks on it. In the case of these subject Persians, often they could not swim and they were in hostile territory. They had to get back to Attica, which was occupied by the Persians. So there were advantages, but it took a general to say to his people, we're not going to evacuate. We have the advantages. Uh, we're fighting on the defensive, as he said. And when they went out to fight, they, they said, Eleutheria, Eleutheria, freedom, freedom, freedom. So they, were, they had the morale and they had a, the moral cause, so they thought. But it was only Themistocles who saw that. I don't think any classicist believes that had Themistocles not been there, a, they would have fought, or B, they would have won. It was, it was hedged on that personality. Everybody else said, over the isthmus, we'll build a wall. Yes, everybody either said and That over sounds the, like a better deal to me than ramming uh, Yeah, I think, I think most people thought it was, or people in Athens thought we should have fought out and had a glorious last stand and been butchered on the plain of Attica, or we should just get out in our ships and go somewhere else. He wins this glorious battle. He saves the Athenians as a people. Yes. He turns back the Persians. I believe you could say he saves what we now it's continue to Western flatter ourselves by calling flatter Western civilization. Yes, he did. And then the later career of Themistocles continues to be ennobling and heroic. No, for the next 25 years it gets worse each year because he wants to take credit for saving Athens and saving Greece and people don't quite agree that he did it all himself because the next year they have a land battle at Plataea where the Spartans are very preeminent. But more importantly, his idea as an, he was the architect of maritime commerce, Athens is a maritime power, a naval power, a radical democracy, an Athenian uh, commercial empire. And his successors uh, em embodied or embraced or expanded his ideas. And he didn't get credit for it. So he's always suggesting that people are taking my uh, prestige away from me or they're taking my ideas. He's exiled, he gets on the wrong side of aristocrats, oligarchs. Fast forward to uh, about 23, 24 years later, he ends up in Persia as a He guest. sells out to the he, Persians. In some sense he does. And then he's probably killed himself at the age of 60, 65. He didn't end up well. His great moment was at Salamos, but that's the theme of the book. Right. All right. William Tecumseh Sherman, the situation in 1864. By June of 1864, you write in the Savior Generals, even First Lady Mary Lincoln lashed out to her husband, Grant is a butcher. By August 1864, consensus spread that Abraham Lincoln would lose the fall election. Close quote. Grant a butcher and Lincoln a loser. Explain if that. Lincoln was nominated, but... If he in, was even nominated. In May, they thought John C. Freeman, who did try to get the nomination and ran as an independent for a while, might be a better candidate. At least Horace Greeley thought that. 
Well, you remember that it had been a year since Vicksburg and Gettysburg and the great Fourth of July victories of 1863. And so then we got the right guy, we thought, from the West, Grant. Grant. We brought him in. We put him in March in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And he said, I've got a, a great lieutenant, Sherman. He'll take my place, the Army of the West. We've got two armies. I'll go to Richmond, 70 miles away. He'll go to Atlanta from Tennessee, 200 miles away. And two great uh, marches will win the war by July or August, right before the election. And all of a sudden, they took off. and. It turned out that Robert E. Lee was not a great offensive general, but he was a brilliant defensive general. And he understood, as some people had paraphrased it, the terrible or the awful arithmetic, that even though uh, the, the, the North may make progress, if they lose three to his two, or that uh, the Northern public would not stand those losses. So if we go into uh, April, May, June, July, August, as we approach the election in this front, right next to the telegraph offices of Washington, D.C., People are saying these hundreds and thousands of people coming into Washington, wounded and maimed from the wilderness, from the cold harbor, Spotsylvania, Petersburg, and the press flip, and we know that Lee today. does not mind a fighting retreat as long Absolutely. as he inflicts pain, and exactly. he inflicts huge and pain. And he did. And Mary Lincoln, uh, who had some Southern sympathies, made the... the Her Horace Greeley said worse things. Lincoln was... Horace Greeley, the great editor of the New York Herald, Herald. as I recall. Yes. yes. And... Uh, Nate Lincoln was incompetent. He entrusted this war to a drunk, and he said things that would now sound neat. I'll stand here. I'll stay out here all summer if I have to, or I don't want to hear what the enemy is going to do to us. Let's do it. But that doesn't translate into winning a war. Meanwhile, they've got William Tecumseh Sherman, who says to himself, "That's not working in the North. Uh, the other uh, between Washington and Richmond. I got to take Atlanta." And I have to do two things. I got to do it before the election, and I can't do it the way Grant is. The country will only stand for one butcher. So but let me let me give a compact account here. May 1864, Sherman begins the march from Tennessee to Atlanta. September 1864. Now he's fighting yes. battle after battle after yes. battle along the way. But by September 1864, he had, he occupies Atlanta. He spares the churches and hospitals, but systematically destroys much of the rest of the city rail lines in particular, ripped up, twisted the, the rails. November 1864, Sherman leaves Atlanta to begin the march to the sea, destroying rail lines and civilian property and his troops consuming the recent harvest, uh, all the way from Atlanta to Savannah, which he reaches in December 1864. Sherman is operating deep inside enemy territory, no lines of communication, no lines of supply. How did he do it? Well, he did it for a variety of ways. And once he got to Atlanta, I remember on September 2nd, he said, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. And at that point, the McClellan candidacy imploded General McClellan. McClellan, the Democratic, Democratic candidate running unionist. against. Unionist. Right. But uh, he probably would have settled for two different countries or a country that allowed slavery with the uh, South back in it. But nevertheless, and then he waited until the election and then went through the march to the sea. How did he do it? Uh, first of all, he had a very different army than the Army of the Potomac. Most of the regiments, I think over 200 of the 220 regiments were from places like Illinois, Michigan, uh, Iowa, Minnesota, especially Ohio and then Illinois. Farm boys from the Farm upper Farm boys who liked camping out, liked to move. And then he imbued them with sort of an elan that said, I won't get you killed. We're not going to do what the Army of the Potomac is. We're going to move. You guys like camping out. We're going to outflank, outflank, and outflank. And we're going to let them attack us. And when the South got desperate and removed uh, Joe Johnson, who was a brilliant tactician, and put in John Bell Hood, who ruined the uh, Southern forces by frontal attacks against Sherman, then he wore them out. When he got to Atlanta, he, even though he'd been fighting at the same time as Grant had, he lost about one-fourth of the men that Grant had. Then suddenly the country woke up and said, wow, all this time we thought that Grant was a butcher, but we see now that, that this was a synonymous strategy because Sherman, and this is why he was a great man, he said, I'm not antithetical to Grant. I don't want to take Grant's glory away. Grant, what Grant did was necessary. I don't know if that's true or not, but at the time... He refused, he refused to, to, to undercut to, to him. benefit at Grant's expense. And he refused to say that his strategy of the indirect approach was a superior strategy to Grant. He said it was complimentary. And he was allowed to do this because Grant, like a bulldog, tied Bobby Lee down and occupied uh, the area around Richmond and prevented reinforcements to go to Atlanta. So he, he really kept harmony within the Union. The Savior Generals, quote, Sherman is often characterized as a heartless prophet of total war. 
with the burning of Atlanta serving as a sort of precursor to Dresden or Hamburg, which the Allies firebombed during the Second World War. Yet few of the enemy died, either inside Atlanta or on his subsequent marches. His ravaging was largely aimed at buildings, rails, telegraph systems, and the property of the slave-owning elite." Close quote. Grant is always intent on closing with the enemy army and destroying it, and Sherman is intent instead on, on what? He's an anti-Clausewitzian. He doesn't believe that war is predicated on destroying the enemy forces in the field, but the situation, the people, the ideology, the psychology that fuels that army. So in Sherman's way of thinking, you don't kill the fish, you drain the tank of its water and the fish will die. So his attitude was, and it was a moral attitude. I know we call him a terrorist today, but his, it was a very immoral attitude because he said, basically, if I could summarize, 97% of Southerners don't own slaves. The plantation class is the most wealthy, affluent class in the history of civilization. They started this war and they're sitting back while they're sending these poor white people, there's no middle, much of a middle class, to die uh, against Grant. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make it very clear. And he said, I'm going to make war and ruin synonymous. I'm going to... Uh, I'll burn those big houses. I'll make Georgia's, Georgia howl. So his idea was to not just defeat the Southern Army, but humiliate the plantation class. Humiliate them and say, here we are, you're a cavalier class, you brag about your manhood and your superior morality. We're here, we farm boards are here, come out and do something. And that was a very uh, bitter blow. He destroys the myth of Southern honor. He does. It's almost, Machiavelli said, you can forgive a man for killing your father, but not for destroying your patrimony. And that's what he did. Grant, Lee, and Sherman, rank them. I would rank Sherman first, Grant second, and Lee third. Grant was, uh, I mean, his campaigns at Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, Vicksburg, Shiloh, his recovery at Shiloh were brilliant. He understood what he had to do, even though he was not a great tactician in 1864. Um, Lee understood at the, at the end of the war that he didn't have to win the war, he just had to make it so costly to get a negotiated peace. He did not believe that in 1863 and four when he went north and ruined his army at Gettysburg. Had he gone around the army at Gettysburg and come into Washington from the rear, I think it might have been a different. Put it this way, Peter, Sherman went south and didn't lose his army or really uh, have very many losses and humiliated the south and took a big city. Um, Lee went north and broke lost, his broke his army and did not take Washington when it was in his, his realm of possibility. To save your generals. Quite simply, without Uncle Billy's men in Atlanta on September 2nd, 1864, the United States as we know it today might very well not exist. Yeah, I, think, I don't think there's any doubt about it that had he stumbled like Grant did, Lincoln would have lost the election, McClellan would have been elected in early November, and the platform that he ran on, he might not have admitted it was a copperhead platform that basically said, I'll give the South two options. They can either exist as a separate and friendly state owning slaves, or they can come back into the Union and the status before the war. David Petraeus. The United States invades Iraq in March 2003, and the war goes extremely well for three weeks. Then the insurgency begins. They're killing Americans and Iraqis alike, and the insurgents continue to kill for month after month after month as war in the United States first begins to erode and then all but collapses. By late 2006, President George W. Bush found himself with fundamentally two choices. Choice one continue the approach of General John Abizade, who's the commander of Central Command, and General George Casey, who's the commander of the national, multinational force, that is the man in charge on the ground in Iraq. Describe the Abizade-Casey approach. This is the first of the president's two choices. Well, I think the Abizade-Casey approach is simply that uh, Islam, radical Islam, the Middle East is a foreign experience for Americans. We don't belong here, and we'll be there long after we're gone. So our attitude is, uh, just keep a lid on things and allow these insurgencies to burn out. Don't ha expose your forces to losses or psychological damage or lose support back home and manage the situation. Maybe a, f a very gradual withdrawal and then uh, whatever it, whatever's left in Iraq will be marginally better than having Saddam Hussein. But do not try to have some nation building grandiose idea that you can impose your values on a Middle Eastern society and make anything better than what uh, was there before. That's choice one. Here's choice two. Reject that military status quo and call instead for a strategy based on the thinking of David Petraeus 
and this new strategy began to be called the surge. Describe the Petraeus approach. Well, the Petraeus approach is that humans are humans, no matter what their culture is, and they react to incentives, both punishments and rewards, so that why you uh, try to kill the insurgents, the Ba'athist, ex-Ba'athist, or the Al-Qaeda affiliates, you also try to get the people on your side. And how do you get the people on your side? Obviously, hearts and minds means for aid, uh, road improvement, opening schools, but also, and this is, I think, the key, is to protect them and to say that you can't publicly say that you're pro-American or you're pro-Western, but we don't care whether you do or not. But privately, Privately, you don't want Al-Qaeda any more than we do. They don't represent your views, so we're going to protect you from Al-Qaeda. And that, was, that so, was a very interesting point. President Bush, fascinating passage in the Savior Generals, that the president effectively overrules his own senior military advisors to go ahead with this surge. I think he overruled every, everybody. The Iraq study group didn't want it. Uh, his senior advisors, most of them didn't want it. The senior... Uh, People in the Congress didn't want it. He'd lost the House. He'd lost the Senate. His approval rating was about 25 percent. Petraeus was very suspect by a lot of people in the chain of command, and yet he, he took a great gamble. Bush said we're doing it. He's going to, yeah. So the surge involves a, a, an additional troops in the number of about 30,000. 30, and it involves, crucially, putting David Petraeus in charge in on charge. the ground in Iraq. So this happens by early 2007. The Savior Generals, quote, the additional manpower of the surge was to facilitate a new effort at securing neighborhoods, protecting the population, and expanding basic services. The protocol sounded almost more sociological than military. Yet in truth, General Petraeus and General Odierno, this is General Raymond Odierno, who's Petraeus' is number two in Iraq and is now the Army Chief of Staff. In truth, General Petraeus and General Odierno killed and captured more enemy insurgents than at any other period of the conflict." Close quote. What is the surge? It's both touchy-feely and deadly. It is, and I think that's why people uh, have caricatured so successfully, because they feel it's touchy-feely, but they don't look at the statistics, and they don't look at the other things that are involved. David Petraeus never said, I'm a genius, I have counterinsurgency strategy, let me do this touchy-feely stuff and I'll win. He said, there are currents going on in Iraq that are favorable to us, just like Matthew Ridgway in Korea. Nobody believed him, but he said they've been fighting and losing for a long time. He didn't attack Casey and Abizade. He said, Casey and Abizade have a try to the enemy, and they're at the point of breaking. Even though nobody believed that, they've lost a lot more than we have. The problem is our will is breaking and theirs not, but they've lost more. So, Petra even as even as the war seems to go sideways yes. for month after month after month, even as support for the war collapses in this country, what Petraeus saw was that through all these months, we're killing bad guys. He did, and he also knew that if George Bush made a courageous decision that we weren't leaving and we didn't have scheduled withdrawals as we're doing in Afghanistan, that would be a force multiplier. He also knew that there was a uh, Anbar awakening. There were people in Anbar province, Sunni Muslims that were sick and tired of Al-Qaeda and on their own spontaneously had risen up and they could be co-opted through whatever means, you know, persuasion, force, money, bri bribes, money. bribes yeah. absolutely. And all of these perfect storm uh, forces were coming together under what we call the surge. And then we had these sort of brilliant guys at the American Enterprise Institute, Fred Kagan, Kimberly Kagan, Jack, especially Jack, Jack Keane, Keane, and Keane. people like Stephen Hadley and Dick Cheney were very supportive of them. And they sort of did all of the logistical or the PR. They did a lot of very important things around the channels. Victor, hold on. What does it say about the American military establishment in our present time? We're not talking about Themistocles and we're not talking about the Civil War. We're talking about effectively the day before yesterday when we're talking about the surge. That this vast Pentagon establishment, including the Secretary of Defense, was opposed to this surge and you had to have a couple of people at a think tank go to a retired Army Deputy Chief of Staff Jack Kane out in his house in Virginia and hold these little sessions over cups of coffee at people's coffee tables. And Jack Kane says, in effect, I think I can get us in to see my old buddy Dick Cheney. Ah, but you're, mi you're missing. I mean, you're missing billions of dollars to the Pentagon and it's useless. I know, Peter, but the, the consensus was not that we don't have enough troops in Iraq. We have too many. 
you're putting good money after bad. It's hopeless. And then somebody comes along like Petraeus or Keene or whoever they are, and they say, ah, we need more people in this rat hole. And everybody said, that's the last thing that we need. And they said, no, we need people. We're at, I guess one of the metaphors they would have used, we're, we're right near the summit. We just need more people to push up the wagon over the top and we'll go downhill. But if we don't, if we quit now, we're so close. And they come they, down they, and crush us. Yes, and they evoked uh, Vietnam. We were close in 71 with Creighton Abrams and stuff. And so why, why after all that investment give up now? And yet most people thought we've already invested too much. And bureaucracies, that's one of the themes of the book as well. These outsiders, these 11th hour saviors, they always have to deal with bureaucracies. The savior generals, quote, the question of what tactic actually brought the peace was never really answered, the touchy-feely or the deadly. Mm -hmm. But we know that without David Petraeus, the American effort in Iraq, along with the reputation of the United States military in the Middle East, would have been lost long ago, close quote. Yeah. We can argue, or and David Petraeus's critics say that he took credit for the Anbar Awakening. He took credit for the work of his brilliant colonels who mapped out. He took credit. He took. It doesn't matter if without David Petraeus's leadership, without his vision, without his endurance. I mean, the, the man literally was on the front lines with his men and getting two and three hours of sleep. Take away David Petraeus, there was nobody else. Or the owner was a, a great American. He was a hero, but it took David Petraeus to see that Odierno had been unfairly caricatured as a ram, ram, uh, He'd been characterized as a butcher. We absolutely. About, right? He'd been sort of a ram that butts his head against him. And Petraeus thought, this guy likes to fight there. and there's subtlety. So he got the right people and he wasn't threatened by talented people. So right. I, I think that uh, because of the controversy surrounding Petraeus, it doesn't matter, just like it doesn't matter with Ridgeway, who controversial, or Sherman. Ridgeway, the great commander who saved Korea. Or Themistocles, 10, 15, 20 years from now, people will look back and say, had the American army lost in 2007 or 8, it would have been humiliated in the Middle East, and its deterrent effect would have been lost, and whatever Iraq is, it would be much worse today. Lessons. The Savior Generals, quote, human nature, even in this sophisticated age, is unchanging. There will be future wars. Against whom? Well, against the so-called bad guys. I mean, it used to be Italian fascists, sometimes it's German militarists in 1914, sometimes it's Nazis, sometimes it's communists, sometimes it's Al-Qaeda, but human nature being what it is, it's not gonna change. There's gonna be people who are gonna take risk for what they perceive as advantages unless they're deterred. My Does view China of, make you nervous? China always makes me nervous, simply because it's not a consensual society. France has nuclear weapons. Britain has nuclear weapons. It doesn't make me nervous. Iran makes me nervous. It's not the weapon or the technology. It's the type of government. And consensual societies are not as threatening to their neighbors throughout history. So uh, I'm a little worried because we're, we have such reliance in drone technology and we have a, this bureaucracy. Let me get to that question. Yes. I, again, I'm quoting the Savior Generals. Quote, do not believe that high technology has made military leadership outdated. Close quote. But, Victor, we live in a day when some... Lieutenant J.G. sitting at a console yes. at Central Command in Tampa, Florida, can push a button and cause a drone to kill people in Pakistan. Where in that setup is the space for military leadership? Because, and now I'm quoting something that actually happened, maybe the drone will go down in Iranian territory, and maybe it has classified information. Somebody's going to have to say, you're going to go get that drone so that the Iranians don't get the technology and sell it to the Chinese. Or say there's a, a, his counterpart in Iran, and maybe he says, well, we can't use drones against their leadership because they're going to use them against ours. The point I'm making, as long as humans are humans, there's going to be age-old characteristics, audacity, courage, imagination, no matter what the technology, no matter what the bureaucracy. The danger is that we fooled ourselves into thinking that we're such a bureaucratic iPhone, iPad society that we've made the human element irrelevant. So one lesson here, this is a handbook for presidents of the United States. And one lesson is, read this book and you're gonna discover that when you get in a scrape, the officers you have in place may not be the best officers. I, hate, I think it might even be worse. The officers you have in place are not the people who should be there. So, so start looking for the renegade, the maverick, the loudmouth, the obnoxious smart guy. Correct? Is that fair? Look for Will Kane and High Noon and Shane okay. on their horizon. The Savior Generals, once again, a great general peels the veneer of invulnerability from a winning enemy. 
convincing his own men that victory is entirely within their purview. In Boston earlier this year, two kids used pressure cookers yes. to create bombs that killed people, shut down one of America's major cities for more than 48 hours, commanded the attention of the President of the United States, and dominated the press for days and days. How do you peel back the veneer from terrorists like that? Well, one of the things you don't do is when somebody asks for a refugee status because their homeland is too dangerous, because they happen to be Muslims, uh, when they do arrive in the United States, you don't say you can go back into your too dangerous territory and visit once in a while. And you don't uh, avoid the word radical Islam or terrorism. You basically say this was an Islamic inspired terrorist act, as was Major Hassan. It was not workplace violence. We're not worried about the Army's diversity program. You have to identify, it doesn't mean it has anything to do with Muslims. It has a, everything to do with radical Islamicists. And you don't have a person in the administration saying that jihad, jihad is a holy cause or uh, the, Moha the uh, Muslim Brotherhood is a secular organization. You have to be explicit and not politically correct and make the enemy feel, the enemy feel that you're unpredictable, mysterious, volatile, but not predictable and not politically correct or they're only going to get emboldened and they're going to look at your magnanimity as weakness. I hate to say that. The Savior Generals, one more time. The Savior Generals were amateur sociologists of a sort. As leaders of constitutional societies, they knew especially the constraints of public patience. During the Civil War, the Northern public puts up with thousands and thousands of casualties before they begin to turn against Lincoln. During the Korean and Vietnam Wars, Michael Lind, uh, has written a book in which he looks at this, the casualty figures. In both cases, it's when we get to casualties of about 15,000 that the public begins to question yes. Korea and Vietnam. In Iraq, the public turns against that war when we still have casualties. Well, the total casualties for the war are about, right, when we get, when casualties are in the hundreds yes. and the public turns against it. Well, you can see where I'm going with yes. this. Does our wealth, our security as a nation, our sophistication as a technological society, in some fundamental way, weaken us by making us too reluctant to take casualties to use our military power? I think it does, and that's the challenge for all great leaders, because when you turn on your iPhone, you expect to be able to call Uganda, and if you can't call Uganda, somebody screwed up. So what you want, it, war has to be as predictable as Google or Yahoo. And the more affluent and leisured we are, we wake up in the morning and we feel that it's our birthright to die at 90 in our sleep. Maybe 90 is too young today. And to not, receive Social Security right up until absolutely. that very day before. And it's always them or they who, who, if we're not perfect, we're not good. We have these incredible expectations, ethical expectations on what America should be. So. Uh, every once in a while we find out that there are pre-modern and Neanderthal thinking going on in the world and that we need somebody in the U.S. military to wade into a place like Iraq or to go into Korea or to go into Okinawa and fight a pre-modern battle. And when they do, they're going to be their conduct, we take it for granted they're going to be victorious, the efficacy is going to keep us safe tonight, but their conduct must be postmodern. It must satisfy everything we learn in the university about utopian ethics and manners. And that's a very hard thing that we put the military in, to be pre-modern on the battlefield and post-modern as soon as the shooting stops. Last question. Famous essay after the Second World War, Henry Luce, the editor of Time magazine, says that the remainder of the 20th century would be the American century. That was the, the great, the American century. All right. To read the books of Victor Davis Hanson, is to sense that you're reading the works of a patriot. Mm. This is a man, there's no doubt, mm. this is a man who believes that consensual society, mm. that the United States, that these values are worth fighting for, mm. and that American conduct, even at its ugliest, Vietnam, the Cold War, Korea, Iraq, was fundamentally sound, if not indeed noble. All of that is in your works. At the same time, what's also in your works, particularly your columns and magazine pieces, you're beside yourself that history is not taught in our high schools. You're infuriated that political correctness of every kind has uh, infiltrated to a very deep level within the American university. 
You're concerned in particular, I've heard you discuss this, that we're living on a kind of cultural capital in the sense that the American military is informed by 19th century values of valor and personal courage and personal sacrifice, and that one reason we're able to do this is that the military is substantial over, that the South is overrepresented in the American military. That in some ways, to the extent that it's effective and honorable, the military is no longer representative of the wider American yes. culture. So how optimistic is Dr. Victor Davis Hanson? Will the 21st century be another American century? But you're talking about a vacuum compared to what? Compared to China, compared to the EU? Fill it in, fill it in. Well, we, in the 30s, we heard that fascism had the, the, the new answer, national socialism. And then after the war, we were told communism was a new man. And then we were told that, no, it's Jap Japan Incorporated. They just bought Pebble Beach, Rockefeller. And then we said, no, that paradigm didn't work. It's the EU. We saw what happened. And then we were told it's China. We see what's happening with China. So constitutional society of the American type has always been more flexible and reinvents and self-critical. Yeah, we're in a bad situation right now, but the building blocks of what you judge societies by, technology today, Google, right 10 miles from here, Google, Apple, Facebook, it's all American. Yahoo, that's what people are doing. They're creating technology for the entire world. Defense, one American carrier group at our Nadir right now has more conventional, maybe even nuclear power than any other country, most of the world combined. The U.S. Marine Corps is bigger than any EU uh, infantry force. Uh, demography, 1.9, 2.0 in the United States when Russia's shrinking, China's shrinking, Europe is shrinking, constitutional stability. The Arab Spring has imploded the entire Middle East. The EU doesn't even have a workable constitution. If I look at, I didn't even get it to fracking, but oil and gas, we're going to be the world's largest oil and gas uh, producer. Not just because we have oil and gas, but because of a constitutional system that prevents property uh, rights, property, it prevents confiscation, and we have a reasonable debate about fracking in a way the EU does not. So whether it's technology or energy or demography or constitutional stability or defense, this country is very self-critical. And we're in, a, I think, a crisis right now, but we've been in crises before. It's not quite like 1861 yet. It's not quite like, I think, 1946 or 1939. Victor Davis Hanson, author of The Savior Generals. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having me, Peter. Victor, this is one of the few shows when I've actually felt ready to go out and, and, and celebrate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Victor. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson.